Aloha, welcome to the 18th episode of the 9th series of the Temple of Surf, the podcast. Today with us from Australia, the legendary Shane Oran. We discuss with him about uh, pro surfing, surfboard shaping and much more. Hello, welcome to the show. Where are you today? I'm in my house at the back of Burley Heads. Um, I've already been down the beach twice to have a look at the surf. We've got no surf here at the moment. Like today, I'm looking at all the reports in Hawaii and I'm jealous because like they're all flying over to Mavericks today to surf the giant swells. And uh, I used to chase that and I still, every day I look at the the swell reports all around the world and I see where the biggest spots are. And yeah, it's great that those guys are chasing it today. Uh, of course, you know, in a certain, in a certain way, you are there with, uh, with them, right? At least. It's... Yeah. That's cool. Right. I, love you, I love your uh, logo, this, the Temple of Sir. Thank you. Ben. Yeah. <laughs> Thank that you. Looks how, I said, that's how we look um, after New Year's Eve. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Or, or it's Christian Fletcher every day of the week. <laughs> we, we, you know, after New Year's, well, after New Year's Eve, we all like uh, looking like that for sure. Maybe, oh, yeah. maybe not that green, but yeah, something like that, something around like that. I'm going to really take it easy this New Year's. I kind of, um, you know, I just. I'm at this stage in my life where it's just like, oh, yeah, I'm going to take it easy. We're actually going to get a swell on New Year's Day, and I'd rather go surfing than, uh, you know, feel feel sick. No, definitely, definitely. I think it's a good, uh, it's a good plan, right? Uh, you can celebrate any other day, no problem. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So um, today I have a lot of questions for you, uh, but if, yep. the first one is I ask everyone on this show is, in your opinion, what is the most important thing in surfing? Uh, most important thing, oh, look, there's so many things in surfing and there's so much, like I always find that surfing just keeps on giving. It's like every time I go for a surf, I just am always stoked. Like I've been, I grew up on the sand, you know, like I grew up on the beach and there was nobody on the beach when I was a kid. So I used to go around rock pools and and just be on the beach all the time. Like I'd watch the waves come up and down and the, you just watched everything about it because I grew up with it. So it just was like in my blood. And like you say, oh, you know, what's, what's it, what, you know, the favorite thing or, you know, what's it's surfing fun. to me, what, what it is to me. And I would just say, like, I really think, I love the freedom about surfing is that the, the freedom that you feel is of expression of when you're up on a wave and you're just riding along and it's 100% up to you what you want to do, you know, and yeah, yeah it's, uh, and so there's so many things to it, but the one thing I love is probably I've had an injury, like when, when you have an injury and you come back to surfing. I remember the last injury I had and I was out of the water for six months and I came back to surfing and just sitting in the water and going up and down with the waves was just felt so great. Just that, you know, not even riding a wave, just being in the ocean, you know? So there's just, uh, there's really too many things to say about what, there's no one thing that definitely not one thing that, that just sticks out to me. But if, if it is, it's uh, the sense of freedom. Yeah, definitely. It, it gives that uh, and uh, to all of us. And we, for sure, we know what you mean, right? And somebody that yeah. doesn't surf uh, doesn't, doesn't know, will, uh, but uh, maybe one day in his life could experience that. And so uh, be part of our, uh, <laughs> of, of our tribe, let's say. Yeah, and, well... There's an old guy here. He died a while ago. His name's Midget Farrelly. Have you heard of him? Of course, of course. He was Australia's first world champion in 1964. And he just, he made boards and he was so connected with surfboards. He used to make blanks for all the board companies. Here's one thing that he used to say 
is everyone should experience surfing at least once in their life. Yeah, I totally agree with him. You know, of course, uh, surf legendary, uh, legendary icon of surf and uh, from uh, Australian perspective is, uh, he was the, yeah. the man, right? So, and not only, also Shaper, isn't it? I, if I, if I, yeah, remember. Shaper, surfer, family man, but he used to, and he was a great designer. Like he, he was really a forward thinker through the sixties and seventies and stuff. And then he started supplying all the surfboard companies with blanks, but he always had his own line on, on his own design. Like he, he kind of went his own way a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. I spoke uh, in one of the episodes with Kio, uh, the, the surfboard company, and I think it was kind of created with Midget Ferry at a certain point, <laughs> if the memory is yeah. right. Um, talking yeah. about surfboard, what was your first uh, proper surfboard? And by any coincidence, do you still have it? I've got some old boards. I, I've got some real old boards. I've got the board that I won the Australian title in 1976, which okay. is an old one. That's a good one. Um, I've got a lot of the board that I rode Waimea on, the 5.8, you know, that, that, that's sort of an iconic moment for surfing is that when I took the 5.8 out and everybody said, you can't ride a small board yeah. in giant surf, right? So that was, uh, I've still got that board, but my first board I'll go, I'll go back to that. So when I started surfing, I was about 10 years old. I used to just swim at the beach up till I was about 10. And then I, uh, I, we started having these boards in Australia. They were made of polystyrene. Everyone had them, right? Uh, all the, all the, like the Tom Carrolls and Ocalupo and all us guys in Australia, we start on foam boards, mm. real thick, you know? And I started, to, well, my very first one, I started modifying them when I was 10 years old. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it was sort of like putting, putting fins in it. We used to make these wooden fins and put them in with melted wax. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's where I started. That's exactly where I started. Okay. So from there, I just kind of. Have all guys would ding their boards and I'd fix their boards up. So that's when I started to get into the resin part. And then I started shaping boards. When I was about 13, I shaped my first surfboard and just went from there. I was always into, I've always been into um, just what I think works, not what you think works. Or I was sitting with my friend today at the beach. And there was all these guys out there and they were taking off and they were just sinking in the white water, just taking off, going 10 feet and just stopping. And I said to my mate, I said, that's what teaches me to shape. I said, see how he, and then he went out on my board for, and caught four waves in less than 10 minutes and rode everyone from outside all the way to the sand. And he was going faster as he was riding on the wave. Wow. But these guys were just riding sort of normal boards. So with boards, I've always, just worked on making them go better. Okay, that's in interesting because anyway, you you are uh, uh, you are the sir, the first test on your board, right? So it's like it's a process that starts from you and then end up with other people. But but do you accept feedback from other people, or you just like you do what you think is right, and then other people will uh, will do their uh, modification if they want. They will do modifications to it. They do, they do give me feedback. Yeah. You know, I get back. I watch guys ride my boards. One of the most significant moves that we ever made, like Jeff McCoy and I were shaping boards together mm. and all the boards, and I've got the boards here, and I'm going to do a video at some stage to show the history of, you know, how, how we evolved boards, right? And... Boards used to be wide at the nose and narrow at the tail. Yeah. Right? And when you turned, the nose had so much area in it that it would pendulums like turn. So the nose would swing more than what you wanted it to because it was had so much up there. It was like flicking something like a, a car, hold a Coke bottle the opposite way and you flick it. It's going to go further than you want it to. Yeah. Right? So when we narrowed the nose of the boards, which is what everybody's writing today, 
right? It comes from our design. Huh. Okay. Right? So the narrow knows you're riding your board? That's yeah. our design. Jeff, okay. Bobby and I. <laughs> okay. Like, did you know that? Thank you. <laughs> did you know I, that? No, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the surfing fraternity, they know that. They know that we were the first guy to bring the narrow nose. Okay. But that came with problems, and then we started widening the tails, and we took them out further than they needed to be, and then we worked out what the balance is. And when you're designing surfboards, it's like cooking. It's like you pour a bag of salt in, and you go, wow, that's good, but there's too much salt. And so with surfboards, it's like that. You can you put too much salt in, like you put, might put too much area in it, or you might put too much straight in it or this, but then you find the balance that's nice. Definitely, definitely. I, I, I see what you mean. Um, but uh, <laughs> I was still uh, thinking about uh, the aerodynamic of like a larger nose. Uh, obviously, it doesn't work, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. I want... well, they, they, work a, they work a certain way, but they do take their own, they take over. Exactly. Like the board has its control. It's not, you're not 100%. You know what it's going to do, but you can't all of a sudden pull it straight back because of the momentum of the, of the swing of it. You know, exactly. like when you get a Coke bottle. And you know who taught me that is he said, he comes up to me one day, Doc Paskowitz. You ever heard of him? Of course. Legendary. Yeah, Doc Paskowitz. He, uh, so Doc comes up to me one day in, in New Jersey and he goes, Shane, I always knew those narrow noses would work. And he goes, it's like you get a Coke bottle in your hand and if you've got it with the fat end at the back, you've got complete control of it. But yeah. you swing that thing around and you swing it, it's going to pull your arm away. Yes, I always, and that's, and that's where I got that analogy was from Doc Paskowitz. Fantastic. Nice. I like this story. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. I've been, lucky to be, I've been lucky to be around all these guys. You but know? Yes, of course. The, the point is that the history of uh, surf, surfing history is kind of limited if we don't go back to the, ancient uh, Hawaiian or Polynesian, you know, it's we're yeah. talking about a uh, uh, very limited span of time where a lot of innovation have been done from a surfboard perspective, also from a way of surfing, a link to the uh, surfboard, shortboard revolution, but not only, you know, uh, we're talking about fins, we're talking about hydrodynamics, we're talking about so yeah. many, but it's all condensed in, uh, maybe in 30 years, right? So leaving those, yeah. years, you, get, you got to know everybody, right? So yeah, in that... a major part of that. Exactly, you know, like, you, know, that. <laughs> you know, like, a, you know, going with the surfing history, like that, what you just said about um, how it sort of happened a lot in that, like in the beginning was like, when we first got surfing was like around the 19, around 1900 was mm. when it first came to Australia. But it's been in Hawaii for centuries. Exactly. Exactly. You know, it was you like in that. the old days, it used to be to when you surfed, it was to for bravery, right? The Hawaiians used the Hawaiian kings used to surf and exactly. it was an act of bravery. Exactly. You know? No, so, yeah. so fascinating the story, right? Uh, of uh, the, the surfing back then. And yes, you know, like uh, I'm fascinated also about the wood, some, some wood that was used only for the royals that could use, only the royal could use. It's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. But now there is like a, a new uh, philosophy that says that the Chinese st started to surf before a wire. <laughs> yeah, well, I heard this. The Peruvians say that they are the first. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yes. Right? Peru and, and it really doesn't matter who is the first. They have their own histories. It's not about who's the first. It's like, but Hawaiians are definitely, they developed it by themselves. Mm -hmm. And the Peruvians developed it by themselves. The Peruvians say that they learned to surf by coming in on the reed boats after fishing, and they used to catch the waves up the river. Yeah. That's, maybe. Where they, that's why they say they're the first surfers. Maybe, maybe. You know what is interesting to me is that um, if you talk about this, is that cultures that were and people that were separated by geography, uh, they were they were able to do the same thing, right? So that's right. 
And so it means it shows that uh, in a certain way, we are all connected spiritually, if you want to say, or in our minds, rather than uh, what effectively we we do today with media or all these uh, all this stuff. Yeah, we are well, that, connected. Yeah, that's right. There's a vibration. Exactly. Like a, like a channel there that, that you know, vibrates and, and, you know, somehow the idea comes up of, oh, let's, you know, ride a wave or, you know, the, this channel. It just, it's not us. No. It's this vibration that right, flows through us that creates all this, the, the, uh, the, you know, the new experiences and the, or, you know. The concept of universality, right? So it's, we're going to go through well, <laughs> a bit more. They have this one, it's, it's similar to this, but they talk about when the bananas, the, the, uh, the apes started peeling the bananas. Yeah. And they start, like, they always used to just eat the banana. Yeah. And then they were on a, a whole other island. And then the banana apes, with no, no, never seeing each other, all of a sudden started peeling bananas on different sides. So yeah. it goes through the animal world. It's through, it's all there. Like, yeah, when, yeah. you know, you choose to uh, believe it. It's there. Yeah, exactly. I totally agree with you. So we go from uh, surfboard. Uh, um, I don't know because I have so many questions, but I I don't know no anymore uh, what uh, uh, sequence to put them. But nevertheless, let's go. Since we're talking about surf surfboards, what is the most important thing in uh, shaping surfboards, in your opinion? Since we were on that subject, okay. Um... To make a, a great surfboard, what is the what is the most important? Thing? Well, like what I was saying is surfboards, basically with a surfboard and with design, curves give you maneuverability and control, and straights give you speed. And, but then you've got the curve of a wave that you have to fit into. So it's a balance of straights and curves. Okay. Right? And we always say everything works. You know, you can have a dog board, but sometimes on a day it'll, it'll, you know, like everything works. Like you see these guys, they go out on a flat piece of wood and they okay. ride away on, on just straights and the straights ride in the curves, right? So uh, for me, when I look, when I do a board for somebody, if I can see a guy surf, if, if a guy is a great surfer, he can have more curve in his boards, like a guy like Kelly Slater, Mick Fanning, they can have more curve in the board. But that, if you and I stood on that board, we'd go out the back of the way backwards because curves are slow. Unless you surf fast, it won't work. You, but curves, for a guy who's fast, can go from turn to turn to turn. So it's a balance. For me, when I make a board, if I see a guy's video of a guy, I can work out how much curve and how much straight he needs. And then you've got about fitting in the wave. The board's got to fit at, at different angles of attack, right? And then to hold on to speed, release speed. There's so many different angles. Like it's, it's uh, like it, when you start talking, it's like building uh, space rockets mm -hmm. and people just don't understand it. So for people, when they get aboard, I say, look, just send me a, a video. And then I know whether I, you know, then the weight comes into it. How heavy are they? How wide it should be? You know, whether the board should hold them up from the back, whether it should hold them up from the front, whether it needs hold up from the back and the front, you know, this all different, you know, so it's uh yeah, it's just a balance. And for me, for shaping, I found after 10 years of designing boards, I knew a little bit. 20 years, I knew a, a little bit more. After 30 years, I knew exactly what I was putting in the board, how it would go. And I can look at a board now after 50 years, like Slater gives me his boards and he goes, He'll show me a board and he'll go, well, what do you think of this? And I go, this will do this, it'll do that. It's good for this. It's not good for that. Uh, see this, this curve here or that straight there, this rail here. And I explain how his boards will fit on waves and how they'll go and what a wave it will be better in, you know, because you've got powerful waves, uh, you've got weak waves. So all different designs are needed, to completely different designs for a, a wave at Jaws that you're going to use in a wave pool, mm, yeah. right? But I can tell, I go to Slater and look over his boards. He'll give me three or four boards to look at. I'll tell him exactly how they'll go, and it's exactly how they go. 
<laughs> That's 50 years of experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you do that after 10 years, I didn't know what. I had one row was different than the other. You know, the bottoms were, it was just, you know, now it's like everything you do, you know what you're doing. Well, definitely, you know, your eye is trained to see all these yeah. little uh, um, changes that makes the, the board completely perform in different way, you know. So uh, definitely 50 years, wow, it's like incredible. From... From uh, sticking fins uh, with the wax to <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I, it, yeah, to to what we're doing today, you know. I mean, like I've got the board I've got at the moment. I've 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 got like an ice skate edge through the bottom of it because ice skates turn on a dime and they bite into ice. So I have an ice skate edge. Yeah. Can you see my hand? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So I have an ice skate edge that bites into the into the wave and just takes off. So as soon as it touches, it reacts and goes. Whereas a, a square rail is going sideways until it, it it like this is coming across like that until it catches on the wave and then it'll go forward. Whereas with a with an ice skate edge, once it's pushed in, it's reacting and going forward. So this is a stuff I've been doing this for about 10 years where I blend an ice skate edge through the edges of the board for the reaction time. So when you hit your, hit your turn, you get instant reaction. You don't get a delayed turn, you get instant. And I got that from an ice skate. So you, you pick up stuff from everywhere. I've got stuff from fishes, whales, dolphins, uh, fastest boats. You yeah. know, I picked up, pick up a little piece of something, try it out, Try to blend in. Sometimes you'll try a design, it goes great straight away. Sometimes you try a design, you go, oh, that's not working, but maybe you haven't put it in right. So yeah. you put like the bag of salt in instead of a pinch of salt. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to throw the whole bag of salt away and say it's not a good idea. You've got to oh. go, okay, maybe I went, I overcooked it. I've got to yeah. pull it back a bit. Or I didn't put enough salt in, I can't taste it. Yeah. So it got no feeling. Oh, so oh. it's a... Or maybe the problem is the pasta, means the surfer. The <laughs> salt yeah. is yeah. good, but the surfer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The pasta is no good. <laughs> All the ingredients are good. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, it, it, sometimes, uh, you know, we never know. But uh, it's good to keep trying, definitely. And what was the, the best wave of your uh, life, the most memorable one? I've had a few, but I'd say um, I surfed a day out at Haleiwa one day mm -hmm. and it was maxed out. People were surfing at Waimea Bay and I turned up at Haleiwa. There was nobody there, not a guy in the car park, no one around. It was just me turned up and I just saw these waves and I thought, wow, I could get out there. I can get one of them, right? So I go out and I'm surfing for a while and my friend actually turned up and got some photos of it. And another guy turned up and filmed it. It's on like some sort of East Coast uh, video that's called, um, so he called it um, Solo Session, the, the My Session. But I, the guy's, um, Chris, anyway, it's, it's uh, so I go out and I'm just, it's a full soul session, you know, like there's nobody around. It's not for cameras. It's just for me to charge big waves. And I get that, and I'm out on a too small a board. The board's eight foot. Right today they ride eight foot in giant surf, but this was on this day you kind of needed like a nine footer. It was pretty big okay. to get in early because you want in a big wave. You want to get in early so you're not getting pitched out with it. And the paddle power and the speed of the paddle super important in a big wave to get in before it starts throwing. Right. So anyway, I take off on this wave and I just get into it. So I'm in super late. I'm scratching down the face of it, this full square face, hard face, like Chopu hard face, and I'm dropping in and I'm skittering down the face and I'm just looking down the line. I'm going, oh, I'm too late. It's going it, to it's gonna close out on me and I'm going to straighten out. It's going to land on my head, right, and it's giant. And I'm actually at this moment I'm, I'm shitting myself, right? Imagine. Yeah. And, and then I go, I've got to go for it. So I hit the turn, and as I hit the turn, 
the wave is already throwing and about to to land on the on the impact zone. It's already pitched and it's it's turned into a round hole. As it's tubing coming over, it touches the top of my hair like somebody just touching the top of your head. Had that one like three inches mm. missed that and hit me right in the middle of the head, it would have killed me. Wow. Yeah, that's how close it was. It would if that wave hit me right in the middle of the head and it just touched the back of my head, just super light. Could only just feel it touch it. And then I pulled up into this barrel and the things just squared up and like you could have you could put a, a two-story unit in this barrel. Okay. This thing was that high. And I just stood up and I just didn't care from there. I thought I could die here, I don't care. And I've just gone and then it's just blown me out the end. And I've kicked out, and I said, that's the ride of one of the rides of my life, right? And I come in, and there's this old Hawaiian mate of mine, Louis Ferreira, and yeah. he got, he come down, and he turned up while I was in the water, and he just had stood up in the tower with 10 fingers, like that's a 10 <laughs> road. And then I look over, and there's this old photographer mate of mine, Paul Gordino. He's got the photos of it. And uh, I look over at him, and he's just uh, cheering. Wow. Right? I've gone out. You know, I went out totally alone, no one around. And all of a sudden I've come in and there's one of my best Hawaiian mates, one of my best photographer mates, and this other kid from, from East Coast who filmed it. How did it happen that you were only alone over there? I don't know. I know that everybody went to IMEA, but come on, you know, like. <laughs> I've had a lot of those sessions. It means I've that. It means that uh, they were preparing that for you, you know, that was your way. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It was just amazing. I mean, it's fantastic. Great, great uh, explanation. I was like picturing it uh, myself. You were there. You were there. <laughs> I was there with <laughs> you right now. <laughs> you were. Saying that. So what does it take to, to surf for big waves? Um... Look, I think big waves are just for certain people who just, it's, it's a natural progression. For me, it was. Okay. I just sort of, you start to surf certain waves. You've got to have an amazing um, knowledge of the ocean. You've got to be super fit and, you know, you've got to be able to relax under pressure because when you eat it, it's, uh, it's one of the, like, you know, when you, get smacked by a wave. I always had this, this um, agreement with myself. I said, I'm never, ever going to breathe until I get to the top. Okay. Right? And I can remember one day I had this one wipeout and I was so deep and I was swimming to the top and I was already out of air and I started to breathe out and I was still in the black because when you're deep, it's dark right? And I was swimming to the top and I'd already breathed out and I thought, oh, I'm gone here, you know? And I, all my air was out and I could just, I had about 15, about 15, about 10 metres, three metres to go, right? 15 feet to go and I was already completely out. But then I just kept swimming and I got to the top and I kind of got there easy. And, I, and that's when I realised that you can actually stay underneath the water after you've breathed out. Long, as long as you, um, when you've breathed out, you can stay down as long as you can when you're holding your breath. Mm. So I had a new, a new, um, a new uh, armory, new arrow in my armory. <laughs> I knew that that could happen. Okay, okay. Well, luckily uh, you were able to reach the surface. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one, I'll tell you, the, the one, one of the, this is like one of the heaviest uh, wipeouts, and this is good for the guys listening on the podcast, is, is um, I, we went out on this day and it, it was flat in the morning, right, and it was 60 feet by 1 o'clock in the day. Okay. Giant. And I was out with Ross Clark Jones, uh, Garrett McNamara, uh, Ken Bradshaw, and you take turns when you're when you're out on the skis. And it's when we're first learning on the skis. It was the early, the real early days. And anyway, I've, I've, um, I'm going out in the ski, and I'm behind. It's I've already had a wave, and I'm last in line. 
And this is the first mega set that's come through since we've been out there. This is like this is like the first. They were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and this was like the mega one. And they'd all gone past it. Garrett went past it. Uh, Ken went past it. Uh, Ross Clark Jones went past it. And I just went to my driver. I want this one. Mm-hmm. So I've taken off. And as I as I'm dropping down the face, it was like this, like a, a lump of like a. a Big lump came out of the wave, and I hit. I thought as it was as I was dropping down, I thought I'll I'll, I'll cut to the left and go underneath it. I go uh, cut to the left and turn around it. As I've gone to turn around this big lump in the face, my rails caught the the lump, and I've just gone ass overhead, landed on the face, and everything just went silent. And I've done this thing like we call it the star man, where I've clawed into the face with my arms and legs to try and stop the skittering down the face. And then all of a sudden, everything went completely silent. And then, bang, I just got picked up, thrown down like a rag ball. I, I felt like I was in, in King Kong's hands and he was throwing me around like a rag doll, right? And I'm down in the black and way down and I'm just zooming along underneath the water like, like I'd been shot out of a gun or shot down a, a, an elevator shaft by a gun. And then... As I'm, and then it lets go of me, and I swim to the top. When I get to the top, there's another wave right in front of me, another 60 foot wave oh. impacting 10 feet in front of me. And in my mind, I go, Do I dive with no air or do I stay up and just get obliterated and get half a breath? Because you know, when you come up, you go, <gasps> like, that's as much air as you can go. You can go, <gasps> Because you're going <laughs> like that when you come up after a bad one. So I'm thinking what do I do. So I, do, I go, I dive under. So I dive under, pop up again. Same thing, another one there. Cool. Dive under, pop up again. There's another one there. Like normally in big waves, one bad wave is, is enough. It can kill you. Two, you're dead, right? You, and anyway, on the, the last one, as I'm underneath the water, my body went completely limp. It just lost all, it just went completely limp. There was no power. And I'm underneath the water and I'm looking at this wave coming and it's like 60 feet across and it's 30 feet down the white water and I'm like six feet underneath the water and it's coming towards me and I go, I'm dead here, right? And then I just, as I looked at it, you know in a a way where it starts to tumble and then, the wave, if you ever look when you paddle and swim out under a wave, you can see that it's tumbling, but it doesn't go everywhere. And right in this one spot, there was this one spot where it wasn't going, and I just swam over underneath the water like about three feet over to my right, and I sat in this one that was like an eggshell, and it was like God being under there and just saving my life. And the, the wave went over my head, around my sides, and underneath my feet and didn't touch me. But it just gave me a bit of, gave me a bit of a waffle. Come to the top, and the, my mate's there with the jet ski. He lifts me up on the jet ski, and I'm standing on the back, and my breathing is just going <laughs> sure. like that for over a minute, completely by itself, right? With me having no control, and it just brought my body body back to life. I was on the edge of death. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Only only people that uh, live this uh, kind of uh, situation can understand what you really had and uh, what you experienced, right? I'm thinking about maybe people in Nazare or Mavericks, you know. Uh, the- They've had it. I, most big wave riders have had a situation where they should die because you always go too far. But it's incredible their uh, resilience, you know of uh, going back after uh, you know like uh, for the next wave right it's uh, yeah kind of uh, addicting addictive yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah, you, what does yeah, it- yeah you cover in half an hour and go back and ride more exactly, you exactly. In half an hour and you're back and you're riding more exactly <laughs> like you put your other tow partner on the ski and then you're recovering and then you know bang you go again what doesn't kill you make you stronger, right? So yeah, what they say. <laughs> what they say. <laughs> Talking about uh, surfers, um, uh, this is another question that I ask uh, quite often. 
is that in your life you met a lot of surfers. Some of them were well known. Some of them were uh, not known. Uh, was there a meeting with one of them that was particularly meaningful for you? Yeah, there is. Like like when you say that, the first guy I think about is probably a guy, Mike Ginsberg. He was into doing yoga. Mm -hmm. I'd say, well, I'll take it right back. I'd say I really got influenced by like Reno and Jerry Lopez in the early days because I saw them on the front of a magazine doing headstands and, you know, sitting in the Padma Sana and I thought, wow, what's that? And that's when I first learned about yoga and yoga has been one of the best things I've ever, uh, you know, experienced and, and it's a life thing, you know, it's, it's, it's in my life today and, you know, those guys and then meeting those guys and, you know, like Lopez has got a really, you know, he's got a really good sort of nature. Like he, you know, he he uh, he eats a lot of brown rice. He's just a real natural sort of guy. So I I became like a, a, a vegetarian, macrobiotic, and started to really get into my food. And I'd say it's because of Lopez and Reno. Oh, interesting. So they, they brought added value to your life more than just the, the surf, right? So it's... Uh... Yeah, the outside stuff. And, you know, like they were beautiful surfers, but it was more, you know, what they did, you know. And I think macrobiotics, uh, food, health food, uh, vegetarianism, you know, and yoga, they're, they're, you know, they're the keys of rejuvenation. They're the keys of staying young. Yeah. Cool. I'll tell, I'll tell this to my wife. My wife, she's a yoga teacher. So I, one, one part is a tick the box. Then we go macrobiotics and, uh, yeah, and vegetarianism is a different story, you know, but it's okay. We yeah. can, <laughs> cool. <laughs> we can try. Cool. Um, and so, uh, today, of course, um, in, uh, you, you continue to, uh, uh, to have your surfboards out there. I see it, uh, when uh, all the comments and the posts that uh, they are in Instagram of people that just absolutely love that. And you have a surf school, right? So how do you spend the time uh, in, in your days? In the day? Well, I get up and pretty early in the morning. I like to have a coffee in the morning. Okay. I do, I do the surf checks on the, on the, you know, on the, I go on Instagram and I look at like stuff going on. I've got guys here that have got surf report. And then I usually will go for a surf, find somewhere to go surfing. And then I've got chores to do around the house. I come home and do chores and I've got family. So I've got to make sure I've got responsibilities to, make sure that I've got food and, and everything there. And I, I do some private surf lessons. Um, one of my favorite days is when I go surfing, I come in and then I go shaping surfboards and I just come home, have a nice shower, sit with the family. We'll watch a movie and, uh, you know, have a nice meal together and a bit of family time. That's nice. And are you working on, um, from business perspective, let's say, are you working on something particular, some new projects or business? Yeah, I've got something really cool for next year. I've got, I'm going to go over to um, Mayhem uh, in San Clemente and I'm going to be making some boards there in May. And then from there, I'm going to go over to England and shape some boards at, um, at the, uh, in, uh, in uh, Newquay, which is, a spot I used to go to in the old days. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. I've got just, I, I've got to get, uh, I'm still, I don't even have a website for surfboards. Mm. Everyone everyone just contacts me from Instagram and just get the boards straight off there. And there's that much there, you know, to stay up with that. And when I make boards, all that kind of thing, I make it for the love. Like I love making surfboards, designing and get, getting, I like to, I think my boards are like a hot rod Ferrari, you know, Lamborghini. They're fast. They're easy to ride. And yeah, so yeah, that's my thing for next year. I'm looking forward to, to that and go and just sort of, it's a new sort of branch out for me because I haven't really, like last year I went to America and I shaped a whole bunch of boards and that was great because you know, uh, it kind of got my uh, signature over there. Yeah, making my mark in in the in the surfboard industry. Yeah, 
it's also the journey, right? Of uh, you going and meeting people, exchanging ideas, surfers, right? It's uh yeah, and you know, like last year I went to Kelly Slater's wave pool. Like that was a great experience. Okay, you know, the riding his wave. It's like to ride it. It's got so much power. Wow! Like you, you, you ride it and you and you fly. You got so much speed. You got speed to burn and and you know you're guaranteed a great wave each time. And then it just sucks out and barrels on a square reef on the inside. And when you eat it. It just thrills you. No, really. It's amazing. But it's a, like since I surfed in the wave pool, I think about it nearly every day. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's a, a pretty, it's a great experience. Wow. You know, like you're building up uh, expectations now, you know, like I really hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you're going to be blown out when you go to Abu Dhabi because that's supposed to be the best one. Yes, exactly. This is what he said, you know, like, I don't know, maybe he's, uh, he's doing, uh, of course, advertising for it. So he has to say something uh, different, but so far it seems like he's a great, great one. And yeah, that, and that'll be your local point break, Kelly's point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the only thing though, you can only go there on high tide. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, like, uh, it's for us, you know, it's going, having the possibility to go at, at any time of the day or the night, even because I'm sure it's going to be open 24 seven. So it's, uh, it's going to be a fantastic thing. Great. So, um, before the end of the interview, I have a six question, uh, yeah. short Q and a, so please answer the first thing that comes up to your mind. Okay. Yeah. Um, the best song sure. that you ever wrote? I would say my 1981 This Is It board. Okay. In any particular moment or it's like? Uh... It was a great board in all conditions. Okay. Okay. Um, your favorite shaper of all time? I'd have to say Jeff McCoy. That's legend, of course. Well, personal question, your favorite song or kind of music? Van Morrison. Nice. Favorite surf spot that you wherever can... I'm surf, wherever I surf on, uh, you know, like I'd say Jaws, Jaws is Jaws or backdoor, Jaws or backdoor pipeline. Favorite surfer of all time. I don't really have one, you know. I'd say in the old days it used to be Michael Peterson, but it's, uh, you know, I I kind of, you know, I really like the way Kelly surfs. Okay. Say Kelly Slater. Okay. Well, for sure, is, uh, <laughs> nobody can say uh, something against your, this, uh, this, uh, your opinion on this. <laughs> yeah. And the last question is a little bit unusual. I'd like to know your best relationship advice. To not um, confront things. Don't be confront confrontational. This is the best thing to help you get through life. I learned it from a 70-year-old key master, Tabata son. And it is, if a truck's coming down the road, are you going to step in front of it or are you going to step aside and let it go past? So if anyone's got a negative attitude and they're going, hey, you fuck, oh, you know what, you know, are you going to step in front of that guy or are you just going to let him go past? Because he's going to find somebody that's going to confront him. It doesn't have to be you. Definitely. Yeah. Well, word, of, word, word of wisdom, right? <laughs> well, it's something that's helped me a lot. Yeah. You know, you just don't be confrontational. Makes sense. Thank you very and much. And, 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 and one, one last one is to relax, you know, under pressure. Just, just relax if, so, if something sort of. You know, if you feel like you're under pressure or anything, just relax. Yeah. Best thing, the best uh, uh, decisions you can make when you're in a relaxed state of mind. Yeah, I know. I, I totally agree with you on that. Yes, you see. You need to breathe and have some oxygen inside your uh, space, inside your mind, you know, not to take yeah. that quick, quick yeah. you know, the wrong one. Um, thank you so much for being on the show with me today and look forward to talking to you very soon. <laughs> okay, aloha. Hello, I uh, have a Ciao.
Hi, it's me again. I hope you enjoyed our today's episode. If you want to know more about us, please follow www.thetempleofsurf.com and all our social media. Mahalo!